So he said, all right, take it off. We'll do some more songs tomorrow. He left the studio, he comes back in. He says, put that album, put that song back on the album. I said, sure, no problem. Boy, he had a lot to say, man. He was definitely a poet and sort of a, oh, what would they call it, a seer? Like, a, like almost like a shamanic seer, a visionary. Sort of guy, he walked in five minutes later, he goes, you're right, man, take that shit off. We're changing the whole album, man. It's gonna be my Machiavelli album, which I didn't even know who Machiavelli was. And I was like, okay. And we're sitting there with the album, not even really mixed. And um, next thing you know, we get a phone call to head in to master it. And stuff isn't even mixed. You know, we just have the dat tapes from the nights of the sessions. And um, next thing I know, the album disappears and it comes out, you know, so like those aren't even really mixes, those are like from the session. Whether properly finished or not, Machiavelli has sold more than five million copies. The album before Machiavelli was All Eyes On Me, Pac's second release for Death Row and the first ever double album by a rapper. Pac's old friend, Money B, from Digital Underground, last saw Tupac when All Eyes On Me had just been released. So, you know, it was about at least nine months or so before he had died or whatever. And we went to the club, you know, and he was, he, he basically had a little section, bought, bought drinks, and then me and him were talking, and I was just telling him that uh, it was when uh, All Eyes On Me had came out. And I was just like joking, like, dude, you didn't call me to be on the album. He's like, you supposed to just come down. Everybody came down and blah, blah, blah. And he was telling me about, he had a lot more albums. Like he had already done a whole lot more music and that he had a soundtrack that he was going to be in charge of and blah, blah, blah. You know, it later, I'll turn, later turned out to be the Gridlock soundtrack. Yeah, that's right. 100.3 The Beat, Harvey Hip Hop and R&B, B-Side Show, K-Slide on the two turntables, Eric Kubici right here holding it down on the MIC. Check it out. Y'all want to holler at us, 888 one zero zero three inside is another bonus blast weekend we got money in our pockets to me all eyes on me was my favorite album because he was he had just already done his time he came out of jail and he had already i think before tupacalypse and those records were very raw he kind of hadn't lived life yet i think after he got put away for a minute he came back and he had already kind of thought about things and he had realized what was going on obviously an obsession to keep going, returning to the same themes, returning to the same set of agonies, and seeing if with this song he can come up with some kind of resolution. And of course he can't, and so he has to write another one. All Eyes on Me was one of my favorites, definitely. I've lost that thing about 30 times. I, either I've lost it or people have stealing, stolen it from my car, you know what I mean? I think everybody is only not, a, I don't think there's nobody alive that owns only about one copy of All Eyes on Me, you know what I mean? Everybody gangs them from each other, so. I got a couple right now I stole too, so whatever. <laughs> um, but that's what drove every great artist. And, and I guess that's why, as I said, uh, I'm willing to put Tupac up against anyone. Usually he was more social conscious, like you listen to Tupacalypse Now, and even in um, um, Strictly For My Niggas or whatever. He, had more of a message, like, all eyes on me was some gangster, gangster shit, like, fuck everybody. The way I, like, I had never heard him just be so much like that, and he was like, man, I just had to get that off my chest. Yo, man, everybody's always labeling shit. In 1995, only a year before All Eyes on Me, came what is regarded as Tupac's crossover record, Me Against the World. This was the first album ever to be put out by someone who was incarcerated at the time of release. With this album, Pac managed to create a commercial hit with artistic integrity intact. And, you know, you may listen to any song by Tupac and think, um, wow, all kinds of contradictions, I'm being pulled all over the place with respect to my sympathies. Uh, what is done to Tupac is often done to hip-hop culture in general. Either it's good and edifying and great because you say things that are not offensive to women, or on the other hand, uh, you engage in discourse that seems to be uh, altogether putting them down, and therefore you're scurrilously viewed uh, and seen as a, some kind of misogynist. 
You have the song he wrote to his mother. Uh, on the one hand, uh, things that are uh, you know, really paying homage uh, to women. And then you have things on the other side that say bitch. And those are same times on the same album. So you say, well, there's a contradiction there. For example, on Me Against the World, we got a song called Young Niggas. Where you telling, where you telling fools, man, you could be a doctor or a lawyer. You ain't got to be on this street selling dope. You know, I mean, that's the whole message of the song. But in Tupac, I think the contradictions are there almost at every moment along the way. We are being pulled up and down at, at the same time. And I feel that he did not know which way to go. Then he got another song, um, Dear Mama, where he's talking about, you know, his mama failed. He said, even as a crack fiend, mama, you still a black queen, mama. You know, so I mean, he, when we hear that in the hood, you know, Pac Mama Dofi, my mom might be, or my auntie, or my uncle, I mean, in the inner city, most of us have relatives or parents that are addicted to drugs or were addicted to drugs at one time or another. The fact that he found musical ways of making those contradictions so palpable at every given moment, uh, his desire to be tough, his desire to be vulnerable, uh, which I think shows up in every phrase he ever, ever produced. Tupac wasn't the greatest metaphorical rapper. He wasn't the greatest, like, rhythm rapper, like a Rakim or something like that. He wasn't, he wasn't the best MC in terms of rocking a party. But what Tupac brought, I think, to hip hop was he was able to inhabit so many different types of souls. The beauty of Pac's voice is also in there in the mix. It's a voice that is very innocent. Um, and it often has an upward inflection as though it's questioning, as though for all the toughness of the words, there's still this child that has been damaged and that wants to be heard. Before these albums, the vulnerable tough guy had found himself in prison and a certain record label boss named Suge Knight came to his rescue.